Hi, I'm here with Paul Hiltz, the CEO of NCH Healthcare System. I'm Amanda Lucy, the owner of the partnership. And today we're talking a little bit about COVID. Um, Paul, welcome. Thank you. Good to be here. Absolutely. Tell me a little bit about your arrival to NCH, a little bit about your background. Well, I've been in healthcare uh, leadership for the last 25 years in both hospitals and medical groups. And I uh, arrived here in September of 19 following kind of a tumultuous time with medical staff relations, community relations, and uh, jumped in with both feet and have really enjoyed being here for the past about year and a half. And just a few months in on the job, all of a sudden we hear about the coronavirus. So let's walk back in time. I know it feels like one year's turned into five or 10 years <laughs> this year, but let's walk back in time and tell me about when you first heard about the coronavirus and what was your first impressions? You know, I remember, and it must have been in January of, uh, of 20, reading an article in the Wall Street Journal about coronavirus on, on a weekend. And I remember shortly after, and it seemed serious, and shortly after that, I remember I was in my car, and I heard that on, on the news, that the World Health Organization had issued a global alert, which really caught my, because they don't do that. And I remember calling back here and I asked John Klein, our chief nursing officer, I said, John, we better call together a team. So tell everybody, clear their calendar for lunch. I'll be back by then. And um, I'd like you to consider forming a group and let's use the command center as if the same structure would be using if a hurricane was coming. But I said, plan on this one lasting longer than a hurricane because if what I just heard is true, this is gonna be around for a while. So let's get everybody in the room and we'll start to organize ourselves. I remember the, the, the call I got from you and it was on a Saturday morning. And I remember you saying, we're gonna close the hospital and we're gonna limit visitation. And I thought, wow, this, this is gonna be a big deal. Mm -hmm. Remember that call? I do. And, the, and the reason, one of the main reasons we did that initially was to preserve the PPE. Because we didn't, you know, we didn't, we knew it was highly infectious disease. We didn't know how serious it was going to get, but we weren't sure at that point. I mean, I was just reading what everybody else in America was. And if you remember going back, Amanda, to the newspapers and TV shows, hospitals were running out of PPE and had to reuse it. And some hospitals were going without PPE. Um, so I, we were trying to be overly cautious and protect our staff mainly because, um, and I know we're maybe talking about this a bit. My, one of my biggest fears when this first thing, when this first hit, was how do we keep our staff feeling safe enough that they won't just run for the exits? And I wanted to make sure we had enough people here to take care of the sick people that were gonna come in. Absolutely. So let's talk about the first 90 days, which were really pivotal in setting up NCH for success. Um, you know, what were some of the steps that you took and, and how did you kind of handle the first 90 days? Well, one of the things that you were really helpful on, and I just learned, a lot about this is board communication because you know you you remember um, boards across America started really reacting in strange ways you know and cutting things and stopping things and you encouraged me to immediately start up the communication with our board to make sure we were in lockstep with them in terms of what we were going to have to do to protect our staff and protect our patients and acquire and. You'll remember another big news story that was on all the TV stations, hospitals in the Northeast and, and across Europe running out of ventilators. So uh, you encouraged me to tell the board what the challenges would be and make sure that, that we had the support to go out and buy plenty of ventilators, buy the PPE and the drugs that would be needed and to prepare for capacity. We actually bought a couple of big hospital grade tents we were ready to set up field hospitals to double our capacity um, and to renovate uh, or to redo the air handling so that we would have negative pressure rooms and to comply with all the different recommendations that the CDC had. I th thinking back to that time, gosh, it was a lot of communications, wasn't it? You know, at one point we were sending communications twice a day. We had board communications, we had internal communications going out, we had communi community communications. And then we partnered with Lee Health, mm -hmm. and you set all that up. And we had a daily media call and briefing with the media to let them know what our daily numbers were, uh, developments that we had, and, and we did that for months on end. 
I talked a little bit about the collaboration with the community because it really it was tremendous how the healthcare system, even competitors, right, came yes. together during the pandemic. Well, you'll remember because you helped me that when my initial arrival here in Naples, we talked about community and collaboration. And that was one of the things that our board wanted me to do even before the pandemic was to be more collaborative and to emphasize the notion of a community health system. So we didn't want to lose that. We were in the middle of a rebranding anyway, but you emphasized and it really resonated with me that during times of pandemic, times of crisis, the community really wants their providers to collaborate and to stop talking about competition. So it really worked well that we got with Lee Health, which is the other big health system in Southwest Florida, and said, look, let's jointly communicate so we can at least eliminate the fear of rumors that aren't true and tell people transparently, this is how many people we're testing, this is how many we're treating, these are the next steps. So I think it went a long way uh, to this community. And in, I do believe that the rebranding we started on has, has really accelerated and has been very successful. We talked about a lot of the wins, you know, the first 90 days and as we entered the pandemic, was there any key learnings that came out of this and anything that you would share with other healthcare leaders and CEOs in this nation as far as what you learned? Well, I think what I've learned is, is that the communication piece of it isn't just a nice to have add on to the actions that you're taking. Communication is really, to me, integral into the strategy. And it starts with internal communication and board communication to make sure that there is consensus and alignment and then secondly, by communicating to the public, we really did, I, I think, save PPEs and save resources and save people from just panicking. Uh, and we, you know, I think we were thoughtful about how we did the testing, how we did the visitation to save some of the, the PPE. And I think in the end, our community feels a heck of a lot better about this health system. They have a lot of confidence. We never did run out of capacity here. We were able to take care of people. We were able to staff the place. And I think that communication was absolutely vital to making sure we were able to do that. And along those lines, you know, a lot of organizations, and in particular in healthcare, of course, in the country, you know, maybe stopped some advertising efforts. Maybe they did stop some of their communications efforts, you know, just to deal with the pandemic. Um, what would you say, you know, what is the role of advertising and marketing now today in healthcare? Well, I think... Uh, Educational is for sure. And, and I do think part of leadership is helping people manage their fears. And I think in a pandemic of any, whether it's a flu pandemic or this coronavirus, the helping a community manage their fears around their health care is just so important. And it's, it's incumbent upon us to do that. And at the same time, we had an obligation to tell the public that we are still a hospital open for business for things like heart attacks, strokes, and other acute emergencies, and to position ourselves that when this thing finally does end, which eventually it will end, we have to be ready to get back in the business. And that's why I think it was nice that we have not slowed down advertising that what we can do for strokes and heart attacks and accidents. And I think that's gonna bode well for us in the future. You mentioned fears, right? And part of leadership is managing through those fears. Um, what about the emotional piece of this in the pandemic and the healthcare workers and some of the fatigue? You know, can you address how you've handled that and how you empower leaders to kind of um, help with the emotional piece of this? Well, it's a, it's a good question. So what we've done here is we have added resources throughout this in, in, to our employee assistance program for our employees to get, you know, psychological counseling, support, emotional support. We've uh, also invested in some helplines for doctors because the caregivers here really are fatigued. Uh, they are worried. It is, you know, for people that think that COVID-19 was a hoax, I can assure you it wasn't a hoax. Mm -hmm. I've been in the ICU watching these doctors, you know, what they call dawn and doff their PPE on and off all day long. It's exhausting. And even today, most of the doctors that are on the COVID units, when they go home, they strip down their clothes in their garages. They don't want to go back into their family without uh, changing clothes and so forth. So we try to pay special attention to the psychological uh, and emotional needs of our caregivers. We've been talking about communication today, and so that's a piece too, the emotional piece and how you communicate with your employees internally. Um, what would you like to say to those watching, any healthcare leaders or other CEOs, um, 
what can they learn from what NCH has done from a communications perspective? Well, I think our, I really like the frequency of our communication. I like the truthfulness of it. You know, transparency is a big word. And, and you being a crisis communication expert have kind of coached and educated our whole team here that we want to be open and honest and transparent, and, but at the same time, not to be an alarmist and not to be a Pollyanna. So we don't say this is going to be over in a week. We say it's going to go on for a while. We're okay. We're going to be okay. We're going to get through this. And here's how we're going to get through it, by protecting our staff, by protecting our doctors, by educating our patients, and uh, by putting resources into, into the educational aspects that, that you've been so good at helping us get out. One of the things that you've done exceptionally well, Paul, is really focusing on the strategic plan and the vision to outline when you first arrived, and then all of a sudden you have a pandemic, and there's been a lot of forward momentum, a lot of progress with this healthcare system, despite the pandemic. A lot of additional work happening from a new ED to um, quality improvement. So, can you speak to some of the work that's been done, you know, alongside and parallel to the pandemic? Well, I, I'm kind of amazed at this team, and I won't take take credit for it because I'm amazed at the speed at which we've been able to make change here. One learning that I had that turned out to be a, a good idea was when we formed that uh, kind of COVID task force. I told the task force it was headed up by John Kling, our CNO, and a, and a pulmonary critical care doctor, Dr. David Linder. And I said, look, pull that team out of the organizational structure and let it be clinician driven. And I will assure you that I will get with the board and I will get the resources needed to implement what you think we need to do. And I think that was a big piece that showed the rest of our 5,000 employees that uh, we are empowering people. It's going to be clinically driven. And if it's the right thing to do for our staff, our doctors, and our patients, we're going to do it. And I believe that helped get people excited about, wait a minute, we really got to keep moving here. So I'm giving you a chance to brag here. There's been some significant improvements from a quality perspective, uh, a lot of forward momentum. Do you want to share some of the athletes? Well, we're really excited about that. It's something that the board uh, really uh, emphasized to me when I got here, we were, had two D grades in leapfrog that we've now moved uh, to or for our two hospitals. We've now moved those to an A and a B, and we think that it'll be one of the most rapid improvements in a healthcare organization in the country. So we're really excited about leapfrog. We've moved from a three-star to a four-star in the CMS star rating, so we're happy about that. And we've gone from a two star to a three star in the STS, that's the Society of Thoracic Surgeons for our uh, open heart program, which means we're in the top eight to 10% of heart programs in America. So we're really excited about the, the publicly reported quality scores. And we've developed our own uh, internal scorecard for quality that we're gonna be sharing with uh, the, the general public to show what we're working on in quality, what's working and what's not, and what our plans are to keep getting better each and every month. How did you and your team accomplish so much during the pandemic? Well, I, I, I go back to the communication piece of it. I think what we've tried to do here is to show our whole team, not just the C-suite, but our whole team, this is where we are and share as much information as we can, including the financial challenges, because the financial challenges were significant. You know, we went from essentially a break-even operation here on about a $750 million net revenue operation to losing $40 million in 12 months. And we, we shared all that. And we said, and there's, here's the way we're going to turn it around and get back to break-even or to an operating surplus, which the last two months, we actually have been profitable. And we try to celebrate those wins with our teams. It's really impressive. It's, a, it's a, a lot of wins. And I would imagine that that kind of helps with morale too, an emotional piece during a pandemic where people are seeing the success and the wins. There's a, an incredible amount of pride and there's two groups that I've been talking to regularly here. One is just the general community. We've had local restaurants have donated over 40,000 meals for our frontline workers, which I think is incredible. Is. Uh, the other piece is our philanthropic community. So we have a group of of people here called uh, medical diplomats. And these are people that have agreed to annually give $7,500 a year 
or more per couple. And the number of medical diplomats here has increased by about 125 families in the last 12 months. And so we've got almost 600 families now that are part of the diplomat club and they do it uh, because they have a lot of pride here. And then what that does for our team is it tells our nurses and doctors, look, your community is behind you. The meals, the donations, donations of PPE, cards, letters, drive-bys, all of that to me helps sustain people during a time of incredible challenge. You know, one of the things Paul's done really well is that connectivity to the community. When he first arrived, he went on a listening tour and really kind of try to get the feedback uh, both internally in the healthcare system and externally as well. And I think that's why you've seen the improvements in the numbers. And it does kind of come back to that, that key piece communication, doesn't it? You know, communication builds trust. And then with that trust, then we start seeing some of the successes we've seen. It's true. And I, you know, even with the pandemic where we really could, I had envisioned going for a whole year out to small groups and so forth. But with the pandemic, I like the rest of the world, you know, we've become a very uh, Zoom friendly. We do a lot of Zooms, but we, yesterday we did one for about 180 uh, families. And so it brought the number to over 5,000 people now that we've touched through Zooms since the beginning of this pandemic. And it has made a big, big difference. Well, thanks for doing this Zoom because I'm sure the Zoom fatigue is setting in. <laughs> So, so we have some exciting news, you know, we're on the heels of the vaccine distribution um, and announcements can be made very soon. And we know we'll have emergency authorization use, you know, here in the state of Florida. Um, how is that changing your planning? You know, what does that look like for the next few months? And how do you balance all your strategic goals with the vaccine coming out and still being a pandemic? What does that look like? Well, that's too, is a work in progress because you were just in a meeting with me where we were, uh, you know, brainstorming ideas around. We don't, we don't know as we sit here today how this is going to roll out. We we were able to, with the help of donors, go out and buy two of the big freezers. So we prepared ourselves and then we lobbied the governor's office and told Governor DeSantis we've got the freezers for the distribution for the Pfizer vaccine. And we were just with our team this morning uh, tossing around the idea of maybe we should put out the word for volunteer nurses, any nurse with an active nursing license they would want to volunteer to distribute this because one of the things we learned about the testing for COVID, it can be very disruptive to the everyday work of primary care and specialty offices. Mm -hmm. So one thought is maybe we take the vaccine distribution sort of offline so that the regular health care can keep going while we do the vaccinations. Do you think that now that the vaccine is coming out and obviously it's not going to be widely distributed that people might get a little bit um, you know, slack on not wearing a mask and, and physically distancing and, and do you have a message for the community and for people around that and how we get through this transition? Well, that's a concern and I think you've been very helpful. One of the, the challenges that we felt that we had here in Florida was as a healthcare organization, as the largest healthcare organization in this region, uh, we wanted to stay out of the politics of the mask mandate versus no masks. Mm -hmm. So what we've tried to say is, look, based on our experience of mandating masks inside the hospital, is that since the beginning of this pandemic, we've only had two employees uh, get COVID from a patient. And after treating thousands of patients, then we would say, well, the masks must have an impact, a preventative impact here. So we've tried to stick with the science and tell the community. And then we partnered with the city of Naples to produce these masks that have our logo in the city of Naples. And you've uh, orchestrated a really nice public information campaign to tell folks that wearing a mask in close quarters is helpful. It is preventive. And again, we've stayed out of the notion of endorsing any particular ordinance or mandate either at the county level or the city level. And I'll add one other you know, really impressive statistic is zero patient to patient exposure, yes. is that right? That's right. Yeah. And so we're very proud of that. And again, we had donors donate some of these germ zapping robots called Xenex robots. And we really believe that those have had a big impact. Are over one of the unintended benefits of, a, of the COVID uh, crisis has been our overall infection rate in the hospital has fallen for C. diff and MRSA and everything else because of the attention to the masks and the hand washing. That's interesting.
And so some people even think that maybe flu season won't be as severe this year because people are wearing masks. Well, it's interesting you bring that up. So we just looked at that yesterday. Uh, this time last year uh, in flu season, we had a little over 400 confirmed flu cases. This year, we've had two cases so far. Wow, that's phenomenal. Yes. I mean, the numbers speak for themselves. So, you know, as we move forward and we have a vaccine, you know, do you think there'll be permanent changes in healthcare because of this pandemic? Do you see, you know, healthcare systems changing permanently? Well, we, we have, I mean, we've done a couple of things already. I mean, one thing is certainly we'll be much more attentive to respiratory illnesses coming into the emergency department. We now have sort of segregated areas in our emergency departments. That won't change, I don't think. I think we'll be much better about hand washing and about mask wearing uh, generally. And I think we're, we'll be looking a lot more at how we process people into the system including the telehealth access that I don't think is going away. Uh, we've learned a lot, and I, in the meetings I've been in with doctors, we think that there will be significant benefits accruing to our healthcare system nationally over the next couple of years based on what we've learned in this pandemic. So a lot of athletes, a lot of impressive work, even during a pandemic. Um, what does 2021 look like, and, and what are next steps for NCH? Well, 2021, we're, we are hopeful that the vaccination will be rolled out through the first half of 2021 and that we will see a significant change uh, in the psyche and in the overall health of the American public. For us, we're gonna continue to focus on quality. We're gonna continue to focus on access and we are in the mindset now to grow again. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we didn't stay hunkered down. We tried to keep our teams focused on the idea that this is going to be over at some point. And as it opens up again, we want to be poised for growth and continue to lead as a health system in uh, Southwest Florida. Any last thoughts or advice you would share from a communications perspective for leaders in healthcare? You know, communication is the key. And the, even if you think you're over communicating, you're not doing enough. You've taught me that. So uh, I think one of the neat things that you've done with your team Amanda here working with us is some of the media training, the speaking training, the presentation uh, training, because we have a lot of scientists here, a lot of physicians who are very smart and teaching them to put information in bite-sized chunks that the public can consume and understand to me has been a great benefit to this community. Excellent. Well, it's been a tough year. Um, it's been a really trying year, but we've learned a lot, haven't we? We have. And I think we are going to come out much stronger. And it's been a pleasure working with NCH and alongside you. And your leadership has just been fantastic. And, and really, the proof is in the numbers. So I hope you learned something today. Thanks for your time. And uh, anything else you want to say last thoughts? And just thanks to you. You're, you're a pro at this. And uh, we could not have gotten here without you. Thank you. Yeah, there we go. We can edit all this out.